Welcome to Inview Plantation. I'm standing now in the doctor's office. This house was owned by Dr. Humphrey Harwood Curtis Jr. and his wife Mariah. And Dr. Curtis went to medical school at Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. And he graduated in 1857. And he came back here and started his country practice. Now, during the war, Dr. Cur Curtis was not an army surgeon, but we do believe that the house, or maybe just the property, was used as a Confederate hospital uh, for a short period of time. And the thing that they dealt with more here than anything else was disease. Um, it was noted that some units, both Union and Confederate, had as many as half their men out at the sick at one time. And that had a lot to do more with the living conditions that they were dealing with. Um, living in a swampy area and a bunch of brand new soldiers uh, living on top of each other. And most of them grew up in farms where they hadn't really been exposed to disease too much. And now all of a sudden, they're really close and they're sharing those diseases. And so it spreads throughout the army. So when people think of the Civil War, they think that the majority of soldiers died from battlefield wounds, from being shot um, or hit by a cannonball or, or things like that. But actually the number one killer of a Civil War soldier was disease. Now it was better um, than in earlier wars. In the Revolutionary War, one out of every 12 soldiers died from a battlefield wound. So that means the other 11 died from disease. In the Mexican War, it was one out of every seven. By the Civil War, it was one out of every three. So out of about, uh, about 600,000 casualties, people that, that died during the war, about 200,000 were from battlefield wounds. The other 400,000, approximately, were from disease. So that was a really big problem. That had a lot to do with the living conditions that they dealt with. It also dealt, had a lot to do with what they knew and, and didn't know about germs. Uh, germ theory was something that was just starting, so they didn't understand that how germs worked and how they could get sick that way. Today, we're going to talk about what happens to a soldier who is wounded on the battlefield. A wounded soldier who can move or is someone who stays behind to help them will make his way to an assistant surgeon positioned in a protected area just behind the battle lines. That assistant surgeon will help him if he can or direct him further back to the hospital. If he can't move, then he often has to wait until the battle is finished or the lines have moved away from him to allow soldiers carrying stretchers to pick them up and carry them back to the hospital. Once he has made his way to the hospital, he then has to wait his turn, as often hundreds or thousands of wounded soldiers are being taken care of. All right, now that we have our soldier uh, brought in here, to, the surgeon needs to see what's wrong with him. So he's going to take a probe, or sometimes just use his finger and go in and see what the damage is. Um, is the bullet still in there? Was the bone shattered? What does he need to deal with um, and make a determination of what his, his next steps are? So that's one of the problems that they had when we, we talk about germs is that a lot of times they use their finger. And that finger had just been in the previous soldier, and so he's spreading germs between soldiers, and that causes a, a lot of problems later on. Now, Justin's been shot in, in the lower leg, and with that, there's a lot of damage that comes from that. Um, you might, he might have been hit by a musket ball, or a mini ball, and that mini ball um, and musket ball are made of lead and it's very soft. And so this mini ball right here, when it hits something hard, it might turn into something like this or this. And so you can imagine what it does to a soldier's bone as it hits it. It's gonna cause it to shatter, not just break, but to shatter into a lot of pieces. And so the surgeon here, he may know how to do a complicated surgery to uh, take care of it, but usually he didn't have enough time. There may be thousands of men waiting outside dying while he's being taken care of. And so the surgeon was taught to amputate if that's what he decided uh, as quickly as possible. 
and move on to that next soldier. And so this amputation should take five or 10 minutes and that's it, um, so that they can save as many lives as possible. So once the surgeons determine that an amputation is necessary, the first thing that needs to happen is he's gonna have one of his assistants use ether or chloroform. And that ether or chloroform is there to, to drug a soldier. Um, it could put him out if you had enough time, but usually there wasn't enough time. So he would be drugged so that he wouldn't be able to feel it. He may still be awake. He may know that something bad is happening that he doesn't like, but he's not gonna feel it. And so our assistant surgeon will take a piece of cloth and fold it into a funnel shape and dip the end in chloroform or ether and put that over his mouth and nose so that he breathes it in. Or we might use a funnel and inside that funnel is some lint and when that's put over his mouth and nose, the lint's there to protect him. Uh, ether and chloroform will burn his skin and so that will collect it as a little bit is dropped into the top so that then he can, can breathe it in. So he's gonna have just enough to, to make him not feel the pain. And the next thing that's gonna happen is we need to make sure that the blood flow is cut off. We don't want him to bleed out while this is happening. So a tourniquet is used. There's a couple different types of tourniquets and that would be put on above the wound and, and it would be tightened up so that he wouldn't bleed out. And from that point, the surgeon is now ready to, to operate. Now, you might think that a surgeon would just go ahead and start with a saw and he saws all the way through, but the problem with that is it's gonna cause a lot of damage and there's a very exact way to do it to make sure that it's healed up right. So he's gonna use a, um, a saw or a knife and a scalpel um, to work his way through the flesh. And as he comes to as he goes through, he's going to come across arteries. And so for that, there's a couple things that he could use. Uh, there's something called a tenaculum, which is a little hook um, that can be used to grab the artery and hold it in place so that it doesn't pull in and so that he can uh, use some thread to tie it off. Uh, or he could use an olive point crane, and that's something a little nicer to the artery that might not tear through as e easily. And so he's going to sew up that artery so that when blood flow is brought back, he's not gonna bleed through um, that artery. As he works his way through, eventually he's gonna come to the bone. Now, most people see the big bone saw over there and that's not used very often. It's a pretty scary thing, but uh, that's usually used for the, the bigger bones, like maybe the upper, upper leg bone to cut through. Um, a lot of times smaller saws are used like the one that he has here. And so he's gonna work his way through the bone. And just like if you're making something out of wood, as you saw through it, it's gonna leave rough edges and, and splinters. And we don't want that as as the flesh is moved back around the bone, we don't want that to be irritating him and causing it to continue to bleed. So he's gonna use a couple of tools here to cut the rough edges off and the rasp to saw it, to sand it down to make it smooth so that he doesn't have that irritation. And then once that's done, then he's gonna take what he's pulled back of the flesh and wrap it around the bottom of the bone and use some thread and bandages to sew it up and, and to cover it to protect it. And from that point, he's gonna have to be moved off and taken somewhere where he can start to recuperate. Once the operation is over, the hard part begins. The soldier is then taken out to begin recuperating. Once he's well enough to be moved, he'll be placed in an ambulance wagon and carried along the hard, bumpy roads off into the railroad, where many wounded soldiers are packed in and transported to larger hospitals to recuperate. These hospitals were often in large cities, including Richmond and Washington, D.C. Often soldiers had to deal with diseases and infections setting in. Each time this happened, it weakened him and made it less likely he would survive. One of the most well-known stories of this was of Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, 
who was accidentally shot by his own men. Jackson had his arm amputated and was transported back to a house along the railroad further from the fighting. It looked like he was going to recover, but he developed pneumonia and soon died. As the sick and wounded soldiers made their way to the larger hospitals, they were then taken care of by the doctors and nurses in those hospitals until they were either well enough to return to the army, or in the case of those who lost limbs, to return home. One of the things that is not well known about the Civil War is that as the war started, it was not seen as proper for women to be nurses. This soon changed as many women on both sides volunteered to help. On the Union side, Dorothea Dix arrived in Washington, intending to help, and made her way to Army leadership to offer. In June of 1861, she was made superintendent of Army nurses and began to recruit women to serve. On the Confederate side, Sally Tompkins opened up a private hospital to take care of sick and wounded soldiers and served throughout the war, eventually becoming the only woman commissioned as an officer in the Army as captain. Many more women on both sides had similar experiences and did much to relieve the suffering of the thousands of men who came through the hospitals. Not only did women assist the doctors in administering medicines, but they also did things like reading and writing letters for soldiers, feeding them, and keeping them company. Many others served by washing clothes and working in the kitchen. It was these women who most sol wounded soldiers came in contact with and whose troubles were eased a little through their help. It was often believed by soldiers during the Civil War and by us now that Civil War surgeons did not know what they were doing or didn't care about the soldiers they treated. As such, when soldiers became sick in camp, many would not tell the doctor because they were afraid of what would happen. As soldiers were taken care of in hospitals from sickness or by wounds from a battlefield, they usually found the best efforts of the doctors and nurses who looked after them. This was limited only by their knowledge of things like germs and by the supplies or time available. The best efforts of these doctors and nurses undoubtedly saved many lives and allowed many to come home to their families.